Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello there. Welcome back. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, this is the fun stuff. This is fun. This I is, love this stuff. I like these rabbit holes. Zeke is so excited right now, she honestly. Is. Fast, she's ready. She's ready to put in her two cents. You know, I, I've I've talked about this so many times. The X marks the spot. Two total solar eclipses in seven years, right? We're more than halfway through this period. August 21st, 2017, the big one happened. I was in Sarasota, uh, Florida at that time. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, I found myself in New Mexico because, mm -hmm. you know, a hurricane was coming and decided we're going to get out for the hurricane and then decided... I don't know. I want to go camping in New Mexico. And it's interesting, all the changes that have happened since this eclipse. This was, everything seems to have gone crazy since this eclipse, in my humble opinion. Well, you know, I remember I was in Nevada with this eclipse, and something came over my whole entire body. Like, the darkness came, and it went, but it was, it was like something totally changed the frequency inside of me. And it was some of the weirdest chills I've ever felt. And I'll never, ever forget that. I never have never felt it since. Um, and I never felt it before that. I just know it was something very, very significant. And actually, my life changed quite a bit after that, too. Absolutely. On August 21st, 2017, America was treated to its first coast-to-coast -coast total solar eclipse in nearly 100 years. Right? Think about that. Nearly 100 years, we hadn't seen coast-to-coast -coast solar eclipse. And so we had our first one. And it was a national eclipse from Oregon to South Carolina. The eclipse traced a 67-mile wide path of totality across the country, and millions of Americans and visitors from around the world witnessed the moon passing between the Earth and the sun and day during the night for almost up to three minutes. Now, the next total solar eclipse in the U.S. is going to occur on April 8th, 2024, traveling through the country from Texas to Maine. Although the 2024 eclipse won't be a national eclipse, in some ways it promises to be more spectacular, crossing over, coming close to more major cities with a maximum duration of totality that's almost two minutes longer than 2017. And I think that there's probably people that are saying, how could this be? You know, how can we have, how does all this work? The dynamics of this. And by the way, many people have said, this is the tribulation period right in here. Some say, you know, they'll look to the great sign in the sky of the woman in travail, right? The revelation sign uh, that they believe happened in September. And maybe it did. It's fascinating to see this. Now, we're bringing up what's going to be happening now as we have December 4th, 2021. We do have a total solar eclipse. Now, if, if you're going to name it, you might want to say this is the Antarctic solar eclipse, Antarctica. As you see, it's Antarctica that's going to be you know getting the most of this. So most people are not going to see this, but does that mean... Um, that it doesn't have an impact. Oh, no, it, it definitely has an impact. Everything has an impact on us. Everything, again, we are in a sea of consciousness. You know, recognize that. Each one of us are tiny waves, tiny projectiles of consciousness in this vast, vast ocean. We're just individual points, but yet we are all connected. Everything is all connected. So definitely, if something is going to be happening on this side of the globe, you can bet it is going to affect us in some way, shape, or form. It's going to change vibration. It's going to change frequency. And things are going to be different. By the way, and, and let me go back to this too, a couple other points over here. Um, where the intersection is, is at New Madrid. This, this intersection is, is basically right at the New Madrid, which is a major earthquake zone uh, in the U.S. And when the New Madrid went, it went for uh, 1811, 1812, if my history is right, it rang bells up in Boston. It was felt all the way down to South Carolina, which again, you know, we could look at this and say, yeah, kind of like all through here, it was all felt all the way over. And if it goes, it's going to be a very big, impactful, um, well, earthquake on the American soil. 
And then we look up here, and of course we have Cascadia, and we have seen many large quakes over in this area of Mexico as well, and this crosses over Texas. So it's, it's really, it, it's very, very curious. And then, by the way, there is another solar eclipse coming, an annular solar eclipse, October 14th, 2023, that when you look at its pattern, you know, it, it, its beginning point is very similar to the beginning point, or let me think, which way did it go now? Yeah, that was the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And it ended yep. in South Carolina. So very similar to what we saw with the first eclipse in 2017, except for it's going to travel down here and create an X marks the spot. Uh, to me, that looks like that's probably around the Austin San Antonio area, or maybe perhaps a little bit west of that, a little southwest. Um, interesting, though, this path is going from Oregon down to Texas. Now, this is October 14th, 2023. Ooh, it's, it's all so interesting, isn't it? As we get another X marks the spot when we kind of do these up and overlaying the three of them would be interesting as well. So again, you know, you look at the, the path here, the path there, and then we bring this one into the equation. What is it all saying? Does it all have a consequence for the United States and for the world? I, I think it definitely does. Most certainly it does. You know, eclipses for a very long time have been harbingers of change. You know, it just depends on where the eclipse is at, uh, the frequencies, what that change is going to be. But many and many traditions, they were not very... Um, friendly with eclipses they just as soon stay out of the way <laughs> yeah and yeah in some cultures you don't go out during an eclipse you know you stay so you stay covered up away from it yeah um very fascinating because well what does it represent well it's it's in the case of a solar eclipse you know the moon's light is blocking out the light of the sun and so it's it's kind of standing in between I could view it and easily in my mind as saying, you know, the sun, again, is a relay. It's the light of source coming to us, you know, through natural processes. And light is information. Light is gnosis. Light triggers DNA changes. And here you have the moon blocking that, albeit temporarily, momentarily. And then the moon is just another whole thing as well. You know, there are some traditions that say that souls go to the moon when they, uh, when the life of the 3D body is done, the soul goes to the moon as a waiting place in so many ways. And that gets you thinking about the great soul um, recycling program, mm -hmm. that 3D, 4D loop that, you know, is perhaps in place, according to some, by the controller system, you know, that know that they can harvest these souls time and time again, utilize them to come right back and do it all over again if they're kept in a lower vibrational frequency. So when we look to Western astrology, December's 2021 uh, eclipse in Sagittarius reveals your higher destiny. Uh, so about the higher destiny, but when we look to Vedic astrology, it's not Sagittarius, it's in Scorpio. And when we look at the Earth, the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees on its axis. Why? Well, and when, too. In everything I've gotten, I feel that this tilt came about in the Younger Dryas period. And I think it came about when the moon was put in place, because I think that's when the moon was put in place, somewhere in the Younger Dryas period, when we had those cataclysms. And that might sound crazy, and somebody had said before, well, what about the Bible? You know, it talks about God creating, uh, you know, a greater light and a lesser light, you know, to light the day and light the night. Well, again, I think there's multiple beings being talked of in the Bible, you know, when we look to the original first words which talks about the spirit of god hovering over the waters of space the waters of space well you know that is talking about what we would call the creator of the universe of this universe now being specific for a reason because as we've we've brought out there 
what we have gotten is that you know there are individual entities that are creators of universes and they are not necessarily the same being uh, and then there is yet still one source behind all that so getting back to this when we look to Western astrology, it doesn't take into place the 23 and a half degree tilt of the earth where Vedic does. Mm -hmm. And that impacts everything. That's why when we look to Vedic astrology, if you're used to your Western signs, they, they do tend to shift often. Not always. It depends on where you're placed. Mm -hmm. But they do tend to shift. Right. And like when we're doing the calculations in Western, they start the degrees at zero. Oh. Absolutely zero degrees. And that's why Western, it never quite fit for me. It never quite made any sense. But then when I started to study a little bit of Vedic astrology, that's when they take into account the tilt of the earth and they start those um, calculations at 23.5 degrees. So it does change most people's signs. Most people have a sign change generally back from what they thought they were. But then they have a small zodiac crisis sometimes. But then they realize, hey, this fits a little bit better. So well, when we talk about the Western system, where does it come from? Well, you know, many will say, well, the origins are Greco-Roman, Greco-Roman. And we look a little bit farther back and we say it's really Sumerian, which we're actually talking about. Instead of Greco-Roman, we're talking about Ijiji and Anunnakian is what the Western system is. So it's the control grid. It's the controllers. Everything in the West comes out of them. And some say that astrology was brought to the West by Alexander the Great when he went to India. And, you know, he did conquer some of India and uh, had his battles with the Persian Empire and all that. Um, yet it was changed and distorted along the way. And again, they want to hold the knowledge for themselves. There's that saying that millionaires follow astrology and billionaires follow Vedic astrology. Because it's just more accurate. It's the more ancient system. So, Jyastra? Let's talk about Jaista, the Jaista. nakshatra Jaista, but let's understand a nakshatra for just a moment. Um, when I do a chart, your nakshatra is the star rising in the east when you were born. And I look at these stars as a, a being, and they have a certain type of personality. They have like a certain, a certain way about them. And... When you're born under certain nakshatras, you are like a prototype or you're a blueprint of this nakshatra or this star being that that lives in that little slice of the sky. So this is Jesta, and uh, this is kind of a difficult nakshatra. It's a very deep nakshatra. It can be complicated. It is. It means the eldest. Um, also with this nakshatra, we have the ruling planet is Mercury. Um, the symbol is an earring or a circular protective talisman. Um, they say that could represent Vishnu's disc. Um, and a lot of people who have this nakshatra, they are very brilliant. They're very analytical. They don't have a lot of friends, but they are cheerful and very, very virtuous. Yeah, and, and this is ruled by Indra, who is said to be the king of the gods, but there's different levels to that as far as when we say king of the gods. We're, we're talking more on our particular level here as opposed to equating Indra with, say, uh, a Shiva or a Vishnu mm -hmm. because Indra himself would basically go and petition Shiva or Vishnu for their help or Brahma. You know, so he would petition these higher level gods. And again, these are all beings. These are all just consciousnesses. Everything is a consciousness. He would petition them for help, you know, for what you would call a boon, you know, granting him a wish, so to speak. So this is the nakshatra that is accentuated in this particular um, eclipse. And at the same time, Antares is is the star that is, and Antares is is curious too, and and we could equate again everything as above so below. So it, it's all about what's going on in the planet, and when you look at Indra, king of the gods, you know you it, very well you can equate um, perhaps that energy to say Jupiter, 
um, to Zeus, that, that type of, 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 of energy, so to speak. And we could equate it to the presiding order. And everything here is really relating to this struggle on, you know, on the planet and within us, too. It, it's, it's our struggle for our independence, mm -hmm. our, our struggle uh, for us cultivating and being able to cultivate the light and overcome the darkness which has been enshrouding us. And so here you see in the pre-dawn sky, you might have been seeing red for the next few weeks. Now, this is from a while ago. But it's talking about these colorful pinpoints of light. And one is Mars, the red planet. The other is its rival, Antares, that red supergiant star. And Mars, obviously, is, is a solid ball of rock. And Antares is a big gas giant. But it's interesting because... Antares, the name literally means rival of Ares. And who's Ares? Ares is the Greek god of war. And Rome became known as Mars. So here we have what's on the horizon. Well, it looks like WAR is on the horizon. And it looks like the system, the powers that be, the real power brokers on the planet, want that. They're trying to create that that. Well, that Mars energy, this is what they've always used. They've used that Mars energy. And the real controllers, actually, were on Mars before they came here, the Ajiji, you know, who are under the Anunnaki control, under the Anunnaki are under the Draco control, the Draco are under the Arcana control, the Archons are under the AI dragon control. Mm -hmm. And it's like they always take these star systems and these uh, set these set these situations up so that the stars and the energies can bring momentum to a certain situation that they want to unfold. So what is this? And then? then we're talking about this is the battle basically between the forces of war and the forces of peace, before, between the forces of illumination and the forces of darkness. So again, we had that great American eclipse, August 21st, 2017, and I just, you know, looking at all these energies, these these energies are like turning points, aren't they? They're, they're just like turning points. And then October 14th, 2023, you know, so we have uh, about 22 months away from us, uh, another great American eclipse, right? And, and the country itself is obviously going through rebirth pains, I guess is what I want to call it rebirth pains because it's going to be changed it's going to be transformed and what it looked like in august of 2017 at that first eclipse is not going to be what it looks like when that's when that final eclipse comes by in 2024 and this could be a key point too just think about the energies that will be here at this time as well this is fascinating we are in a period of such rapid growth and change right now April 8th, 2024. So, you know, you're going to basically have this be about six months apart, these these two. Oh, boy. Big, big changes are on the horizon. And then we could just simply talk about that Pluto return that we, we've done videos on before. And a key point in the Pluto return is February 19th, 2022. This is going to give us that first exact conjunction that's going to take place. And the Pluto return is, again, all about a recreation of the original creation. And again, this is you know portending the fact that this country is not going to be what it was. It, it's changing. It's going to experience a rebirth of sorts. But that might not be as one unified country. That could be as, you know, four distinct areas that are governed distinctly in different ways or five or three or two we don't know for sure what we've gotten from the guides in the past is you've you've seen four and four different zones um but also the potential that it might not be that way because we're changing everything as we go and pluto is is all about you know recreating what has already been created so when we look to the Kardashev scale, this talks about just what is possible with civilizations based on their technology and growth. And what would humanity be able to do if it didn't destroy itself? 
and wasn't under necessarily the control of these these dark beings so much, or even with their control, uh, what could we do in say a thousand years down the road? How about ten thousand? How about a hundred thousand? How about a million? What would technology look like? Just think back to you know when you were a little kid and how far technology has come. Well, a type one civilization harnesses all the resources of a planet. Carl Sagan estimated that Earth is right now about 0.7 on the scale, and that was, you know, perhaps uh, several decades ago. Type two harnesses all the radiation of a star. Humans might reach type two in a few thousand years, being able to actually control and utilize all the energy that comes off of the star. Uh, that is our star. And then type 3 harnesses all the resources of a galaxy. And we might re reach that in a few hundred thousand to a million years. Well, how about beings that have already been here 10,000 years, 100,000 years, a million years before us? How about those metal spheres that we find in rocks, you know, say that we've seen in Siberia and in Africa that are in rocks that are dated to 2 million years ago? So somebody was creating metal spheres with technology two million years ago on Earth, two million years ahead of us. So what type of power do they have? What type of ability would they have? Well, not to mention those um, spheres that are at the Vatican, those pretty trophies. Well, <laughs> she's jumping ahead, and then look at what we got next. We have the Dyson Sphere, which would is. be used to harness the energy of the sun on display at the Vatican. Mm -hmm. Because they know that what they profess as a belief system is not what they truly believe. That's just for, you know, public consumption. Mm -hmm. And right here is a display of what is really known as the fact that that extraterrestrial interdimensional technology is is in effect right now if they could build a dyson sphere and control a star how hard do you think it would be to move a moon into place or you know in in perfect placement you know a dyson sphere is is something that is something that you know our scientists now could look to the future and say maybe someday we could do that and then you know the sky is the limit, so to speak. Harnessing the energy of the sun itself. How about the ability to actually move suns with technology? To nudge them into a different orbit? To move planets around? You know, there are legends that kind of point to the fact that at one point in time, Saturn was the original sun. We could look to uh, certain traditions that have the Sabbath day on Saturday, which is Saturn's day. Interesting. You know, there's, there's a lot. And when we go into the legends of the aboriginals, and it's harder and harder to find this stuff. It's hidden away now. They're trying to purge all of it. Mm -hmm. And this was written by Emmanuel Velikovsky, who wrote about worlds in collision. And Velikovsky thought that Venus was actually a, a trapped comet, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. and wasn't originally there. And there was a period when the Earth was moonless, according to the most remote recollection of mankind. Democritus and Anaxagoras taught that there was a time when the Earth was without the moon. Aristotle wrote that, Arca Arcadia in Greece, before being inhabited by the Hellenes, had a popu population of Pelagesians, and that these Aborigines occupied the land already before there was a moon in the sky above Earth. For this reason, they were called proselenes. Now, think about this, too. If we go and we just take a peek, you know, at, at how these eclipses work. Let me see, where was it? There, and, and you see how the moon is positioned just so that it perfectly covers the sun. How could you do that? Is it just, does it show the work of divinity, or does it show the work of technology? Think about that. I mean, does it show the work of divinity? This is the divine plan of the perfect creator, or does it show, 
you know, they have the technology to use a tractor beam of some sort, a gravitational force, to move it into the exact spot where it'll appear to be exactly the same size as the sun at these times. And when you start looking at the irregularity of eclipses, too, okay, so the last one was 100 years ago. Now why all of a sudden are we getting multiple ones? You're getting three and what? Huh? When you start to question and not trust the science, because maybe the science has an agenda behind it, and part of it is controlling the true knowledge of the masses and limiting the true knowledge of the masses, then everything starts to go together. Well, you have to add everything up. You have to look and see what's sitting there in the front lawn of the Vatican and everything else that we're being told, things that we were told growing up, you know, how they teach us in school. And then ask yourself if, if this is a plan, if this is a plan from the divine, or is it something that might <clears throat> possibly be manipulated? Apollonius of Rhodes mentions the time when not all the orbs were yet in the heavens before the Danae and Deucalion races came into existence and only the Arcadians lived, of whom it is said that they dwelt on mountains, they fed on acorns before there was a moon. And we have also gotten that the original inhabitants of the earth uh, just only ate of that which the earth gave freely. They didn't really mm -hmm. try to cultivate anything. Uh, they didn't have to. Um, they basically ate of fruits and nuts and things yeah. along those lines. Yeah, that which is offered. Offered is how they, how they worded it. Plutarch wrote in the Roman questions, there were the Arcadians of Evanders following the so-called pre-lunar people. Pre-lunar people. Similarly, wrote Ovid, the Arcadians are said to have possessed their land before the birth of Jove. And the folk is older than the moon. Who's Jove? Jove, some will equate that. Jove, Jehovah. Um, and then some have made the uh, analogy to, as well, you know, Jupiter and Zeus. But Jupiter and Zeus in, in, in a different light. So, um, it's interesting, we'll not spend all the time getting into what we've gotten so far about those Greek gods and Olympian gods right now. That's definitely uh, enough material to cover multiple or a whole series of videos, really, as, you know, things are not as they, they seem to be at all. Not at all. And... <clears throat> older than the moon. So you see, and, and actually there's there's a tribe in Africa that speaks of remembering two brothers that were at constant conflict with each other, and that's when they brought the moon here. Hmm. And you know, we also have heard the same stories coming from the Cherokee people. They remember a time before the moon was here, and they basically uh, also are equating the moon with these reptilian beings that that came at that same time and exerted themselves. Uh, the memory of a, they exerted their, their power and influence and took control. So, very interesting. You might also find some allusions to the time before there was a moon in scriptures. In Job 25.5, the grandeur of the Lord, and again, that's a very, very generic word. There's been so many different... Uh, you know, truly defining words used that we give this just one term, Lord, to cover it all. Who makes peace in the heights is praised, and the time is mentioned before there was a moon, and it did not shine. Also in Psalm 72, 5, it is said, Thou was feared since the time of the sun, and before the time of the moon, a generation of generations. A generation of generations means a very long time. Of course, it is of no use to counter this psalm with the myth of the first chapter of Genesis, a tale brought down from exotic and later sources. And the memory of a world without a moon lives in the oral tradition among the Indians, the Indians of Bogota, highlands in eastern Cordillas or Colombia, relate to relate some of their tribal reminiscences to the time before there was a moon. In the earliest times when the moon was not yet in the heavens. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, this is getting sassy riled yeah, up now. Yeah, she's really got to say something. So there are currently three or three theories about the origin of the moon. The moon originated same time as the Earth, being formed substantially from the same material, uh, aggregating and solidifying. Or the moon was formed not in the vicinity of the Earth, but in a different part of the solar system, later captured by the Earth. Or the moon was originally a portion of the terrestrial crust and was torn out, leaving behind the bed of the Pacific. So you have these different lines of thinking. But it's fascinating to see that there are many cultures that remember a time without the moon. And so if the moon is literally placed there to have a certain effect on the earth, as we know, it influences women's cycles. Mm -hmm. And isn't it interesting, also, we could go back to Genesis, and because you have, you know, eight of the, of the apple, right, of the knowledge of good and evil, then all of a sudden women are going to be giving birth in pain and travail. Yeah, I mean, why do they got to say all that stuff? Is there any relation to the moon? The moon cycles. I'm on my moon, you know? Right. You know, it's, it's said that um, a lot of women should, I believe, it's ovulate on the new moon and start your cycle on the full moon, I think. But it definitely cycles with the moon. And I never knew that until I started to study herbology. And then I found this out. And, I mean, what does that say about how we are so connected with our interplanetary everythingness. Exactly. And so, you know, what we have gotten, as many others have, is that the moon is truly a base. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it was a natural um, planetoid sphere. You know, it, it, it was a natural thing that has been hollowed out and turned into a base to be utilized. So, it does have an effect on us. Mm -hmm. Everything has an effect on everything, and it's so close to us. Science will tell you it's it's typically too large for a planet of the size of the Earth to have a moon that large. And if it wasn't here, you know, modern science might tell us, well, we, we wouldn't be able to survive without the moon. But again, modern science often tells us the exact opposite of, of the reality. And what we would have if we had an earth that was not tipped at 23 and a half degrees with this wobble that we have going on, we would have harmony, peace. We would have a lot less severity to the weather. And we've also gotten that, you know, as this structure breaks down, when we move out of this Kali Yuga, the moon will be revealed. Re <laughs> it'll be revealed for what it is yeah. and it's going to be removed and the Earth's going to be put back into its its regular motion. It will be back in harmony. Everything will go right back into harmony where it belongs. And, you know, it's really going to help when it comes to evolution to have everything in perfect balance. Interesting. You know, if you want to view the stars, the best time to do it is when the moon is not full. Because the light of the moon basically blocks out the reality of the brilliance of the Milky Way and all the stars that are out there and just how much life is out there. Think about it along those lines and, and those stellar influences, each single, every single one of them is a, a being. Those, those are Elohim in and of themselves and that they are very high beings and benevolent beings giving life to so many countless forms of life. And they're shedding and sharing their light all the time with everyone around. And what does the moon do? It, it blocks out their light, so to mm -hmm. speak. And it, it causes it to have less impact on us. So this is all fascinating, and I look forward to your comments. Please do share your comments on all this. Yeah, it's really enjoyable to go through you guys and see what you guys take away from all this. Yes, and so we do want to thank again all our patrons. We couldn't do it without you guys and also your support over at Medicinal Food. There's a link on every video. Use the coupon code EEA to get a discount and support the channel. As always, God bless and namaste. Namaste.